session. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 12304 in the name of Miles Briggs on improving Edinburgh City Bypass. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Miles Briggs to open the debate. Mr Briggs, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I want to thank colleagues from across the chamber for supporting my motion and allowing this debate to take place today. I wanted to start the debate this afternoon with a quote. And it's, be warned, City Bypass is a nightmare today, been on it for an hour so far. That was the palpable frustration being vented on Twitter yesterday by the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy, Paul Wheelhouse, MSP. And I'm pleased to report that I spotted Mr Wheelhouse in the chamber yesterday, so I know he has since managed to escape the congestion our bypass faces. Deputy Presiding Officer, I believe the future of the A70 City Bypass is important, not just to Edinburgh and the wider Lothian region, but to all of Scotland, and it's a key trunk road serving our capital city. Improving the bypass is an issue that I've been pressing the Scottish Government on since my election. It's something I'll continue to do so. As a Lothian MSP, I continue on an almost daily basis to be contacted by frustrated constituents and business people who face frequent delays when using the bypass to commute or transport goods, especially, but not ex exclusively, at peak times or when there's been an accident on that route. Concerns have also been raised and voiced by the Federation of Small Business over many years um, here in Lothian. Many drivers tell me their experience is that the tailbacks and traffic jams are becoming more and more regular. Indeed, some drivers tell me they are choosing to drive through the city of Edinburgh rather than risk being stuck on the bypass, something that is obviously adding to the pressures on local roads within the capital itself. The transport information uh, company INREX in, in late 2016 identified the bypass as the most congested trunk, ro trunk road outside of London, with four of the UK's worst bottlenecks located on that route. It suggested the westbound section near Dreghorn Barracks was where drivers faced the worst delays and predicted that the bypass congestion would cost the economy as much as £2.8 billion by 2025. With Scotland's economy already facing such sluggish economic growth over the next five years, this is something which I think the whole parliament must take extremely seriously and something we cannot allow to occur. Transport Scotland, transport model for Scotland uses 2014 as a base year for the total number of vehicles per day using the trunk road. And it indicated that 78,000 vehicles every day use the city bypass west of Dreghorn, Dreghorn Junction in 2014. It predicts that this will grow by an extra 10,000 vehicles to 88,000 by 2022 and a further 10,000 vehicles by 2032, with 102,000 vehicles using a bypass each day by 2037. In addition, the percentage of heavy goods vehicles using the bypass will also increase. So around 14,300 lorries and heavy goods vehicles will be using the route each day by 2037, compared to the current figure of 9,400. Constituents and businesses are rightly alarmed about the increased usage predictions and the capacity of the road already not being able to cope with the current volume of vehicles using it. And the projected increase in vehicles may well be under, underestimating the number of extra vehicles that will actually use the route, as Edinburgh, Mid, East and West Lothian continue to experience such fast-growing populations and new housing developments along the route, such as the bypass at Shawfair. Edinburgh Lothian and Lothian are currently the only parts of the Scottish economy which are still growing and we need, are now the powerhouse of the Scottish economy and for that growth to be sustained in the future there must be that infrastructure of investment to allow areas to continue to attract business and inward investment in key sectors like life sciences with Edinburgh's BioQuarter, Queen Margaret University and now the proposed studio, film studio at Strayton located just off the bypass. Gridlock trunk roads create a bad impression for inward investors and those wanting to visit our area. Edinburgh is the showcase for the whole country and we need to have the modern and efficient transport infrastructure to deliver that. The Minister will, I'm sure, in his contribution at the end of the debate, refer to the Scottish Government's investment at the Sheriff Hall roundabout, where the final plans for the much needed grade separation and flyover will be revealed sometime this year and I hope he'll be able to give a firmer timetable today on that. Introducing grade separation at this notorious bottleneck is, of course, very welcome. But this is only one action, and over many years we've been campaigning for further action and for more improvements. Almost a decade people, commuters, have faced these sorts of backlogs and now want to see real action across the whole bypass. 
But it's vital that the Scottish Government receive that message from Lothian residents and businesses, that while Sheriff Hall will be an important improvement, it's only one part of what needs to be done in a far broader, long-term and coordinated pro programme of improvements to the bypass, which will ensure traffic can be kept moving for the decades ahead. This means looking at innovative solutions, assessing whether extra lanes will be needed, looking at the possibility to use hard shoulders in some situations, and utilising technology so the bypass could and should become a smart motorway. It also means looking at how genuine and effective public transport options as an alternative to using cars can be taken forward as well. I receive complaints about bus services in West Lothian, again on almost a regular basis, and it's clear that residents in that part of my region do not have the same confidence in their bus services and therefore do not use the public transport uh, which is available to them. And this is an issue which I think also needs to be seriously considered. The Minister, is re in responses to written questions of mine, has said that the Scottish Government is lo looking at further measures to improve traffic flow on the bypass and reduce congestion. But we have never seen any further information beyond that answer. And I hope that today will give us an opportunity to start that debate and look towards how we can improve our bypass. And I hope too that the Minister will also provide very clear assurances that the Scottish Government recognises the strategic importance of the city bypass and considers that improving it is actually a national transport priority and is fully committed in the future to ensuring that this trunk road is actually fit for purpose. What I'd like to see today and what I'm calling for is the Scottish Government to take forward a feasibility study into widening the city bypass and new options to address this growing and unacceptable congestion. That is what Lothian residents and businesses I represent deserve and that is what I'll continue to press the Scottish Government on. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Briggs. Open debate. I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Jamie Green. Mr Beattie, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me first thank Miles Briggs for bringing forward this important issue as a member's debate. The Edinburgh City Bypass is the most used road in my constituency of Midlothian, North and Musselburgh. And whether it's used for commuting to work, family, or even sports fans travelling to grounds to play or support their team, this means that any time of the day, during any day of the week, there are vehicles using this road causing delays and queues. And the people of Midlothian, North and Musselburgh meet the queues of traffic heading onto the bypass on the main roads around my constituency even before they're anywhere near the bypass. This causes more congestion and more air pollution around Midlothian and Musselburgh. At this point, I'd like to note that my colleague in the adjacent constituency of Midlothian South, Tweeddale and Lauderdale is unable to take part in this debate as she's in the chair. But I would wish to put on record her continuing concerns, which she has raised frequently, regarding the proposals for the Sheriff Hall roundabout, which cyclists call the meat grinder and would ask what measures will be put in place to give cyclists safe passage in the upgrade. On the early morning radio traffic news, there are always reports of delays in the Edinburgh city bypass, with either an accident or just sheer volume of traffic. With this happening on a daily basis, it's a clear sign that a change needs to happen and is required to be done as soon as possible. One of the more drastic options that could be considered is the approach that was taken in Bangkok where the main roads were double stacked, meaning that cars travel in one direction on one level and the other direction above them. When making these changes, they also raised the level of the cross city light train track. So the train and the stations which serve them were suspended well above ground to make commutes quicker and allow trains to move faster. Following from that thought and, con and continuing consideration of the changes required in the Edinburgh city bypass, I think the real solution is that we need to more carefully examine our public transport services to see if there's any way to improve and extend these services and reduce the amount of cars using the bypass. Less cars quite simply mean less congestion. Public transport in Edinburgh and Scotland as a whole is at a very high standard, but there's always room for some improvement. To ease congestion on the city bypass, it may be worth considering extending the route of the Edinburgh city trams to include towns with higher populations like Musselburgh and Dalkeith. This would give commuters a fast and direct link into Edinburgh without having to sit in traffic and the bypass. It may even be more cost effective than building new roads, double stacked or not, and putting in place expensive flyovers, which will only move traffic more swiftly into the next traffic jam. The bypass currently has two lanes both directions and has had that, con that configuration for the last 30 years since it was built. If we look at expanding the bypass, for instance, to three lanes, there would be an eye-watering cost of paying for landowners to give up land 
for allowing the extra lanes to be installed, plus, of course, the actual construction costs. This has been taking away some of the scarce arable land currently situated at the side of the bypass and also threatened the already endangered Greenbelt in Midlothian. As we look into making any of the changes required, I think it's important that we consult with many different agencies, such as Lothian Buses, ScotRail and Border Buses, as well as engaging our constituents that are most affected by the current issues on the bypass. I'm pleased that the government has announced that there's a flyover being installed at the Sheriff Hall roundabout. It's often the scene of congestion, significant queuing, particularly as I experienced myself in morning and evening peak times. This will improve road safety and journey times for many people traveling on the bypass every day. More needs to be done to make improvements along the full stretch of the road. Another possible idea that could be introduced is a bypass bus. The bus would serve Musselburgh to the Gyle along the bypass, stopping at the park and rides at Sheriff Hall Straighton, and then a final stop at Hermiston Gate before finishing at the Gyle. This bus could help reduce the amount of commuters taking their cars along the bypass and assist people reaching their destination easier without having to change buses. It would, of course, need discussion with many different bus companies and the government officials would need to look into this further. With a fast-growing population in Midlothian and Musselburgh, we have to take a serious look at the situation on the bypass and put in train the changes that are required as soon as possible so the bypass can handle the volume of traffic that seems to be increasing so drastically every year. Presiding officer, there's a problem on the Edinburgh City Bypass and with growing population and an increase in people using cars, it will only get worse. We have to take a sensible approach to this situation and look at all of the ways we can improve the current situation on the bypass and help our constituents travel safely and securely. Thank you. And I understand, Mr Beattie, you have a, a constituency meeting. You have to leave the chair early. As I've given the reasons that's perfectly acceptable. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Colin Smith. Mr Green, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, well, I don't know what to say now because Miles Briggs has already outlined the problem and Colin Beattie's now outlined the solutions. So uh, I'm sort of stuck in the middle of re perhaps repeating myself slightly. But I think it's a very good opportunity here to uh, just raise awareness of this issue in the Chamber today. I mean, Edinburgh is our capital city. Uh, it's such a huge focus for, for businesses, for tourism, and as Miles Briggs said, for inward investment. And it is so important that we, we get this uh, right. Um, the, the bypass uh, at the moment is, well, where do you start? Uh, the, I don't know about other members, but uh, the idea that I would leave here at decision time on a Thursday and even attempt to go on the bypass is just uh, a, a no-brainer. It's much better to leave earlier or wait a few hours in town. Not that I ever leave early, Minister, but, uh, um, you know, the reality is that many people are in the same situation. Many businesses, many commuters, uh, many people who rely on this road, not just people who use it or enjoy using it, people who rely on this road are stuck in the situation day in, day out. As, as the member said on the radio, uh, you hear reports of, of congestion almost by default as the first line of the script on the radio. Um, the reality is around nearly 80,000 vehicles a day are using this road, and that's going to increase by around 30 percent by uh, 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 in the next 10 years. It's actually quite a dire situation. We know that Edinburgh is actually Britain's second most congested city, and guess which one is third? Glasgow. I was surprised by that figure. It's not Birmingham or Manchester, as I would have expected it to be, given the, the, the volume of population. It's Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, you know, uh, as Miles Briggs says, in terms of bottlenecks, Edinburgh is listed four times. And that's not four different roads, it's the same road. It's the A720 westbound in every single situation. And that's before we even think about the uh, situation on the A8 coming into Edinburgh, which is uh, e equal, uh, equally a mess. The, the cost of this is huge. It's costing, uh, drivers spend, to put it into context, around 31 hours uh, a year sitting in traffic on Edinburgh cities. Uh, if you were a small business and you took 31 hours off of running your company, that's a tremendous amount of loss of revenue and time wasted sitting in the car. Uh, uh, now, public transport absolutely is an option and, and modal shift is important and we as a parliament do spend a lot of time talking about how we achieve that shift to public transport. But the reality is some people do have to spend time in their cars, their vans and vehicles. And that is simply wasted time. It's costing the economy uh, billions of pounds, nearly three billions of pounds, uh, a year in, in, in Edinburgh. I don't think the answer is simply banning cars. I don't think the answer is simply widening the road. I don't think the answer is simply b building a flyover or increasing the, the scale of the roundabout. I think the, the answer is a bit of 
all of the above. I think there needs to be a real uh, joined up approach to the measures that we have to take. We do need to look at improving the road. The traffic on the road has grown immensely over the last, uh, since it was built. I think it was built in 1980, uh, the year I was born. Uh, so it's, it's not a huge surprise that the volumes have increased at the rate that they have. Uh, so, yes, there does need to be some uh, measures, and I do think there should be a feasibility study into widening in it, but it also needs to be part of a, a bigger conversation about how we address the decades to come when traffic volumes are increasing by the hundreds of thousands, but also the nature of what our roads do, what serves their purpose uh, in the future. Um, the idea that they could become smart roads, the idea we could implement more dynamic lane management systems or variable speed limits, or uh, various uses of lanes for buses, cars at different times of the day. Um, I know that happens to a small extent at the moment, but I really get the impression that, that we as a country and across Western Europe have not been particularly forward thinking in the way that other countries have been, uh, as was demonstrated by the member in, in parts of Asia, for example. So I won't repeat too much of the statistics that, that we already know about this, but given that the volumes are going to increase, and given also that the population of Edinburgh and Midlothian is, in, is going to increase so dramatically. We do have to have a sensible uh, uh, and frank discussion about how we future-proof our transport network uh, to meet the needs of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Colin Smith, to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome any opportunity to debate Scotland's transport infrastructure, so I'm, I'm therefore grateful to Miles Briggs for tabling his motion on improving Edinburgh's city bypass. The bypass is unquestionably one of the most important trunk roads in Scotland, circling around the south side of Edinburgh, enabling access from one end of our capital to the other, but crucially also linking the city to key routes to the rest of Scotland and the north of England. While well, there have been improvements, such as the Dalkeith Bypass and Lane Winder in at Sheriff Hall, it's fair to say that the, the A720 has remained largely unaltered since its construction in the 1980s. It hasn't really adapted to either Edinburgh's growing population or its rising visitor numbers, impacting adversely on the economy of the city and indeed Scotland as a whole. Recent studies imply that the bypass and parts is among the most congested stretches of Trunk Road anywhere in the UK and the Scottish Government's own figures suggest that will get worse with an anticipated 20,000 more vehicles using the bypass per day within 20 years. As a result, there have been long-standing calls for major improvements, not least of course at Sheriff Hall, a place name that sends a shudder down the spine of any commuter into Edinburgh tuning into traffic news first thing in the morning. I hope therefore that, that when summing up the Minister will update the Chamber on what progress is being made in moving the planned upgrade at the Sheriff Hall junction forward from choice of preferred option to an actual timetable for construction and whether there is any option to bring that particular project forward. And in doing so, I also hope the Minister will, will outline, as, as Colin Beatty has requested, what improved opportunities there will be for cyclists and indeed pedestrians as a result of the Sheriff Hall proposals, including whether road segregated cycle routes will be built into approach roads and all six axes of the junction, as this is currently unclear. There's also been calls for the use of smart motorway technology, which Jamie Green mentioned, to allow, for example, the hard shoulder to be used on the bypass at peak times. Now again, I hope when summing up, maybe the Minister will update members on whether there has been any assessment of such a proposal which would replicate, for example, the use of the, the smart motorway system on the M42 near Birmingham, both on the basis of whether it would actually reduce congestion, but also what any safety implications would be if such a scheme were considered. In addition, I know that in the past there's been proposals for an Edinburgh orbital bus route to help take cars off the bypass. I think in 2012 feasibility studies were undertaken to ascertain how the route running from then the fourth road bridge to, to Queen Margaret University via the A720. Yeah, I'll take an intervention from Jamie. Yeah. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank uh, the member for taking intervention. I, I think he's making some very valid points. We'd accept that actually technology is going to play quite a big part of this. The idea that you can in real time monitor traffic volumes, levels and directions and make instant decisions somewhere centrally to alter uh, that flow uh, could actually be very useful in Edinburgh. Colin Smith. So that's why I think it is important to, to assess such schemes and looking at examples elsewhere in the UK is one example. We do, of course, have to have to look carefully at any any safety implications of, for example, using using the hard shoulder during during peak times. But these are options that have to be looked at because we can't simply build our way um, out of congestion. Um, as I said in the past, there has been suggestions of a, a, an Edinburgh orbital bus route and feasibility studies were undertaken. It would be helpful to know what exactly has happened to those particular proposals because they do seem to have been parked somewhere since then. And that's despite the fact that the increased public transport has to be at the heart of any solution to the current congestion on the bypass. Now, when I travel to Edinburgh, uh, I confess I do everything I possibly can to avoid bringing my car. I take the train 
from, from Lockerbie, but despite the fact Lockerbie is only an hour away from Edinburgh on the train and an important commuter route, there is no direct early morning rail service from Lockerbie into Edinburgh. Now, the Transport Secretary will be pleased, or Minister will be pleased to know for once he's off the hook in that one because the franchise rests with the UK government. So maybe Miles Briggs can have a, a chat with the UK Transport Minister who handed out that franchise and get it changed. Better still, of course, he could nationalise that particular route as the, the UK government have a taste for that particular policy uh, as we've seen the East Coast mainline. Absolutely. But uh, let, let's extend that. that. But, uh, President Officer, a, a key part of, of tackling congestion on the bypass must be to invest in alternatives to the car, such as a, a railway system, which passengers and frankly not profits are the priority. The Border Rail Link, I have to say, has shown that when you build railways, passengers will come. So instead of making people drive along the A1 and the A7 to Edinburgh, adding traffic to the, the, the bypass, let's extend that rail link to Carlisle through Langham and, and reach more passengers. And imagine how many cars we could take off the, the bypass if, for example, we reopened the Pennycook to Edinburgh Waverley Rail Link or we revived the Edinburgh South Suburban Railway. We also need to invest in our bus network and, of course, properly regulate that network. Lothian Buses within the city in particular is a good example of what our bus service can do and can be. So let's aim to replicate municipal bus ownership right across Scotland. And I have to say, avoid decisions like the recent one from Conservative-run Borders Council to cut funding to the Dumfries to Edinburgh bus service, putting that very service at risk, which would no doubt add more cars to the Edinburgh bypass. President officer, road improvements are badly needed on the bypass, and I hope we'll see more than just the proposal at Sheriff Hall. But we also have to accept that we won't be able to build our way out of congestion. Better buses, trains and improved active travel opportunities also need to be at the heart of any solution. Thank you. Yes, I've been quite liberal, but we, I don't want to have to continue the debate with a motion without notice if necessary, so I'll try to, to be neater with them, um, uh, with your speeches. Emma Harper, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate on improving Edinburgh City Bypass. I'd like to thank Miles Briggs for bringing this debate to Chamber today and also remind Chamber that I am the Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Rural Economy and Connectivity Portfolio. I thank members for their contributions so far this afternoon and I agree with the wording in the motion that good transport links, including the trunk roads, are key to future economic development. And members have mentioned being stuck in traffic. Nobody wants to be part of congestion or stuck in traffic or delays or part of lengthy tailbacks on any road, especially when we all have places to be, to get to work, to commute and we have business to attend to or even as visitors or tourists to our country, the region and to our capital city. My previous experience in driving in Los Angeles, five lane dub on both sides on the 405 freeway network, but it sometimes took me two and a half hours to drive 18 miles to work, it meant that driving during the rush hour was avoided by me. Sometimes that road was known as a giant car park and the rush hour lasted many hours so obviously I'm not suggesting everybody avoid the rush hour. It was just one way I was able to achieve a 35 minute uh, commute instead of two and a half hours. So I empathize with people who are stuck in traffic. And the motion today is focusing on improving the A720 Edinburgh Cities bypass. And as an MSP for the South Scotland region, I'm frequently on the bypass, depending on which northbound, northbound road that I use to approach the capital on my way to parliament. I'm often quite familiar uh, with the Sheriff Hall roundabout, although I do avoid it. Six entrances and exits, it's quite challenging to navigate the lanes and the roundabout is busy, especially at peak times, as the motion mentions. And when reading the back background from Transport Scotland regarding the Sheriff Hall roundabout improvements, I noted that there has been a consultation on various options, starting with eight proposals, which was then reduced to three. And the agreed option, option B, was to introduce grade separation, overpasses and underpasses. Grade separated roads, um, the junctions are typically quite space intensive, complicated and costly. And that might be due to the need for large physical structures such as tunnels, ramps and bridges. And the height can be obtrusive and this combined with large traffic volumes that grade separated roads attract tend to make them unpopular to nearby landowners and residents. Hence the need to consult with road users, businesses and residents to ensure the infrastructure proposal is optimal. The proposed grade separation for Sheriff Hall roundabout will consist of two bridges so that bypass traffic is separated from local traffic. 
And from reading the background documents, I note that there are some unique design challenges for this work. The area sits on top of historical mine workings and a geological fault with possible mineral seams, fault zones and mine shafts. Although mining has long ceased in the area, the work that still needs to, take, um, to be carried out needs to take into account the ground conditions which are complicated. And of course, the Borders Railway, which goes through the South Scotland region, right past uh, um, Presiding Officer's uh, area, is also very close to uh, the Sheriff Hall roundabout, which is about 300 uh, metres away. In the Scottish Government's programme for government, a commitment was made to review the National Transport Strategy and Strategic Transport Projects Review. And this will be an examination of the strategic transport infra infrastructure interventions which will be required to support the delivery of the national economic strategy. And it will continue to deliver a transport network which is fit for the 21st century and future economic development. It's interesting to note that everyone is lobbying um, the, the minister and I'm obviously one of them as well. So he's quite well aware of the fact that uh, the STPR2 in the South Scotland region is looking at the A75, 76 and 77. So we all have infrastructure needs that we are asking for, especially when the roads to Cairn Ryan and the ferry port near uh, Stranraer, which I warmly welcome the review of the roads in the South Scotland region. So, presiding officer, in conclusion, I welcome the progress that has been made by the Scottish Government with infrastructure improvement across Scotland, and I look forward to hearing the comments from the Minister regarding progress on the innovative long-term solutions that will keep traffic moving, especially on the Edinburgh City Bypass. Now, I appreciate that members, I want to give later members a fair crack of the whip, so I will require, uh, because I've got members wishing to speak in today's debate, I'm never minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. It's up to 30 minutes, not going to be 30 minutes. So I'd ask Miles Briggs if you'd move that motion, please. Formally moved. Are you in agreement? Thank you. Uh, no members having disagreed ever extend this debate. Understanding Order Rule 8.14.3, and I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Lindhurst, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted that I now have much longer than the four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Only joking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, the dreaded uh, radio traffic reports, and uh, these are a daily headache for the commuters of Edinburgh and Lothian. Edinburgh City Bypass is a standing fixture of these, whether it's congestion at Hermiston Gate heading east, a tailback at Dreghorn, or queues at Straton. And of course, there are lengthy delays at the Sheriff Hall roundabout, but a lot of this is almost not newsworthy for those who are familiar with these places. Indeed, one would have to be an uninformed visitor from the moon, perhaps, to be surprised at any of this, sadly. And as a Lothian MSP, I'm, I'm all too familiar with this uh, arterial road and the, the A720 and how it's crucial to the service of transport links in this area and yet is uh, such a stumbling block, block for getting anywhere. And that's already been referred to by Miles Briggs and other colleagues across the chamber. And it's not that surprising because the bypass was built in sections starting in 1980 and completed in 1989. Now I'm not saying that Jamie Green is old having been born in 1980 when it started. But of course, it is ancient in terms of transport and the increase in traffic that we've experienced in Scotland since the 1980s. And it's not just uh, the increase in use of cars or transport requirements, but also the, the house building that has taken place. Indeed, there are new houses being built in Frogston uh, as I speak, hundreds of new houses. And this, the A720 as it is now, having been constructed at the time it was, is no longer in a fit state for what is required. So the Scottish Government has a number of urgent challenges. First and foremost, to deliver the Sheriff Hall grade road separation project, which has been referred to. And uh, we don't have draft orders published for that yet. Uh, but that means even longer queues, more frustration for drivers, uh, for those who have no option but to go through there. We've already heard from Colin Smith about the lack of public transport links, even for those who wish to use those. So people have to use the A720. They have to come this way into Edinburgh. And of course, there are other considerations about the Sheriff Hall roundabout, a number of campaign groups, and I'm thinking predominantly of the cycling lobby, who voice concerns about their safety. And of course, cyclists are some of those who are trying to use alternative means of getting to work. 
And uh, I have indeed asked the Minister previously, as he'll know about this, and I look forward to him updating Parliament on how cyclist safety is being incorporated into the favoured option for the Sheriff Hall roundabout. So there are a few other things that I would like to hear from the Minister about. Um, are there further ideas in the pipeline for increasing capacity to other points in the A720, such as increasing the number of lanes, as has been suggested? Are there any other innovative, and I think there is reference to this possibility, solutions that might uh, be available in this 21st century? And finally, perhaps, if Scotland is to beat other countries in phasing out petrol and diesel cars, has the Minister given thought to how electrical vehicle charging points can be incorporated into road improvement works on or nearby trunk roads such as the bypass, uh, particularly in circumstances where commuters going on and off these roads at peak times uh, make that a very lengthy process? So will extra capacity be provided to make that an experience and a possibility. These are considerations that impact not just upon Lothian, but indeed the whole of Scotland. So Deputy Presiding Officer, in concluding, the residents of Edinburgh and Lothian want to see improvement to their city bypass. Many of the concerns have been voiced today. Uh, I hope that these concerns have been heard, will be taken on board by the government and that the Minister can give us uh, some clues as to how these uh, points will be addressed in the near future. Thank you. And I call Neil Finlay, last speaker in the open debate. Mr Finlay, Thanks, please. Thanks, President. I will be brief. Um, the uh, bypass is, of course, the bane of many people's lives. Uh, tens, of th tens of thousands of people drive along it each day. Uh, often it becomes one of the biggest traffic jams uh, in the country. And that loss of economic productivity, leisure time, family time, the pollution and the frustration uh, and the all-round waste of time of being stuck on that road is bad for the economy, for the environment, for the health of residents and the well-being and, and, and the sanity of drivers. The uh, Lothian's area is experiencing significant and uh, has been for some time significant population growth and the demand for goods and services, for housing, GP practices and other public services uh, are there for all to see. The, the roads infrastructure as it stands is simply not fit for purpose to serve that growing area. This is the capital city, it's the economic hub uh, of the region and, and an economic hub for the country. And the bypass is uh, an essential link to the south, to markets in uh, the northeast and, and beyond and to the south of England. Uh, and also to the west, to the central belt, Fife, and, and on to the north, a key road for Scotland's economy and for those who work in it and produce the goods and the wealth that uh, we enjoy. We, we need major investment and uh, a comprehensive approach to tackling what is an absolutely chronic problem. And there have been many technical solutions, some proposed today that I found very interesting. Uh, and, and others proposed over the years. But my appeal to the Minister is to make this a national infrastructure priority now. We've had feasibility studies, we've had desktop studies, we've had all sorts of people look at this over the years, but we need action and we need uh, progress. President Officer, I would rather pull my teeth out with pliers with no anaesthetic than drive the bypass each day. I have to. I'm sure you would, I'm sure the Minister would volunteer for that. Um, uh, you, might be, you might be in a queue. Um, <laughs> um, but I have a choice. Many people have no option uh, and have to endure that misery each day. So I appeal to the Minister to act with uh, real haste in this and uh, uh, help uh, release my constituents from the misery of the daily commute that many of them uh, have to undertake each day. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Hamza Yusuf close to the Government. Minister, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. I found today's debate uh, very insightful, actually very useful, uh, and a good debate actually all round. And I thank Miles Biggs for bringing it to the Chamber. Uh, I thank all the members uh, for their contributions, which I think have been a very, extremely constructive uh, in, in their approach. I'm going to try my best to just to answer uh, a number of, of the questions in, in one second. I think are just worth emphasising one or two points on behalf of the government, and, and that is, of course, uh, our investment in major infrastructure uh, since 2007 
uh, £20 billion pounds in national uh, infrastructure and transport infrastructure. And of course, uh, the Queensferry Crossing being part of that, M M73, 74 motorway improvements recently, and of course, the continued investment in uh, Edinburgh Glasgow rail improvement projects. So there is a lot of investment going uh, into transport, but clearly uh, the message uh, from, from everybody around the chamber is they, they want to see uh, more of that, and I completely uh, understand that. Uh, worth just touching on a couple of themes and a couple of points that, that were mentioned. I think a really, uh, a really good point made by Colin Smith, and just quote him, uh, was that you can't build you can't build your way out of congestion. I think that's very, very true, uh, indeed. And you have to look at, uh, of course, investing in public transport. And I'll touch upon that uh, in a minute as well. But also, uh, as Jamie Green and Colin Smith and a few others, I think, have said, uh, is looking at technology. Uh, as well. In November of last year, uh, Transport Scotland, we published our, our Future Intelligent Transport Systems Strategy, uh, and that is, of course, looking at how we can use technology uh, in a smarter way, and smart motorways absolutely a part of that, and very much a part uh, of our thinking. So how do we progress ITS, Intelligent Transport Systems, uh, across our infrastructure? We're seeing some of that, of course, across Queensferry Crossing. Uh, the ideas that are mentioned here around looking at the A720, absolute given undertaking to see how we can look at smart and managed motorways uh, and that uh, technology on the A720 and, and report back uh, to members uh, on that. A few um, members mentioned, of course, the, the, the uh, South uh, East City uh, Region Deal uh, Agreement, uh, the heads of terms uh, signed. Uh, the, 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 the investment in, in Sheriff Hall uh, roundabout is worth saying is, is not an insignificant investment. It's 120 uh, million pounds for that grade separation. It's quite hefty. But the other part of that that comes alongside that, just worth putting on the record, is it's 20 million pounds uh, for improvements to public transport in West Edinburgh. So that was, uh, again, mentioned by a number of people around public transport. So 20 million pounds on top of the 120 million, um, which is which has been uh, in invested and been committed, I should say, uh, for that. Let me try to address some of the issues that have been uh, mentioned in relation to, to, to Sheriff Hall, uh, if I can. A uh, number of members asked about cyclists, and indeed uh, I know the Deputy uh, Presiding Officer herself has asked me about this uh, and, and, and her position as a backbencher here uh, and as constituency uh, MSP as well. Um, in terms of uh, cyclists, uh, I fear to say that there was a, a, a vocal uh, backlash, I think, from the cycling lobby to initial proposals that have been put forward. And it was important for the government, and I said this at the time, that we listened to what the cycling lobby, who I've got a very good relationship uh, with, we brought them in, listened to them uh, around uh, what their concerns were. We've done that. Uh, we've po spoken to spokes, to Sustrans. They're very much part uh, of our conversations, uh, our, of our engagement. So when those final proposals come forward, I would hope it would be to the satisfaction of, of those who are cyclists, not just members of spokes and sustrans, but those uh, who cycle uh, perhaps routinely or indeed leisurely as well. So we are you know, hearing what cyclists uh, have to say uh, very much about that. Uh, in terms of um, the, the other theme that was mentioned by a number of members was around, uh, I think, Colin Smith, can, can you bring forward the construction uh, of, of uh, that uh, project in particular. Uh, you know, we, we do, of course, uh, have statutory obligations uh, that we have to, to, to go through. And people sometimes kind of roll their eyes and go, oh, geez, it's that uh, old excuse around statutory obligations and processes and so on and so forth. I would say, and, and, uh, you know, having challenged my own officials uh, around this on a number of projects, if we don't go through those statutory processes, or indeed if we try to bypass them or shortcut them in any way, we would be susceptible potentially for, for a legal challenge. And that would, of course, delay the project uh, even further than that. But I can give an absolute assurance that we'll do everything that we can within our power to deliver this scheme as quickly as we possibly can. We expect to publish draft orders uh, in 2019 for formal comment. Now, because of the size of the scheme, there could be, I'm not saying there will be, but there could be objections. And then, of course, depending on those objections, there may be a need for a public local inquiry. I don't know. We'll have to wait to see. But my point is, it's impossible for me to tell you an exact construction date if I don't know if there's going to be a public local inquiry uh, or not. But what I can do is give you an absolute assurance that there's no need for a delay, there's no intention for a delay. And this is, uh, as Neil Finlay has, has, has requested me and others have requested, this is the... Uh, you know, an infrastructure project of national importance, not just the Sheriff Hall roundabout, but indeed the A720. And I'll come on to that in, in relation to the STPR uh, too as well. I thought a number of members made some good points about reducing the number of cars. I thought Jamie Green spoke well that there's not one silver bullet or there's not one magic solution uh, to this at all. We have to look at, yes, improving the A720, improving Sheriff Hall roundabout, but plus other sections 
of the bypass, but also can we look at reducing the number of cars? And that is something we're doing in terms of investing uh, in our railways. I think the points made again by other members, Colin Smith um, uh, and Emma Harper made these points as well. I think other members did around buses and public transport. Hugely important for us to continue to invest in, uh, in, in those uh, as well. Uh, and then there's the points made by, by, by Gordon Lindhurst, which I think made very well around electric vehicles uh, and the uptake of that. I'll take away <coughs> his suggestion uh, around uh, seeing how we can include electric vehicle uh, charging infrastructure on the A720. He knows our commitment for the A9 in that respect. Um, we have to seriously ramp up uh, our uh, infrastructure on electric vehicles if we want to meet that 2032 target, which of course we have every uh, intention of doing so. So I'll take away uh, that suggestion uh, made. In terms of um, all of that being said, of course, and sorry, I should have said in relation to, to uh, some of the suggestions made by Colin Smith on, on railways and investing in, in perhaps future lines. This is a good time to be having that conversation. We are going into control period six. Uh, there is, uh, of course, a pot of funding available there to have discussions around uh, future uh, enhancements. In terms of, the, the, really finally, uh, the point made by, by Miles Briggs uh, around uh, feasibility, around widening, there's a lot of work going on at the moment within government from uh, a variety of studies, the NTS review, but importantly, the Strategic Transport Projects Review as well, which will be the overarching document for infrastructure investment in the future. If you won't mind, I'll take away his suggestion around the feasibility and I'll come back to him. What I don't want to do is duplicate work if there's already a number of studies that are going to be no point in, in, in doing some of that. But uh, the, the message is very clear from him and, and from every member that's spoken. And it's one that I agree with entirely that this is a, 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 a part of a trunk road network that is of national importance because of its location, because of, uh, of course, the economy, but also, uh, frankly, uh, as I think Neil Finlay said, because of the sanity of people uh, in order to, to try to commute on their everyday journeys. And I think for our, our perspective, I'll continue to keep Parliament updated, members updated that have an interest, a lot of work going, going uh, and, and I thank everybody for their very helpful and constructive uh, contributions. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. Nice to spend this meeting until 2.30.